Okay, today is, uh, well, this is the seventh week, uh, so this is the uh, seventh chapter. Um, a couple weeks, we're going we're gonna to do two chapters, but this one is just a, sing a, a singleton, so we'll get started. Uh, we're today, we're talking about lifespan development of the brain and behavior, so that should be fascinating for everyone. The brain contains about 100 billion neurons and an equal number of glial cells, which is about 200 billion neurons uh, and glial cells. 200 billion uh, glial cells. Well, we won't go into that. It is estimated that there may be as many as 100 trillion connections within the brain. And this is one of the reasons why you can't duplicate the human brain. Uh, 100 trillion is a lot. <laughs> While genetics play an important role in creating the brilliant creatures that each and every one of us may be, the environment guides the process of development. <clears throat> That's one of the reasons why everybody needs stimulation of one kind or another. We all seek stimulation. We all seek these, these uh, uh, connections in our brains. The most rapid brain growth is during gestation, but it continues to expand markedly through the language acquisition years. For an egg to be fertilized, it works. now we're going to talk about how, how random it seems to be that, that people actually are born. <clears throat> For an egg to be fertilized and, and come to term, everything has to be perfect. Everything has to be perfect. That's why it, there, there is such a miracle of childbirth. Uh, not that they are born alive, but the fact that they ever make it that far. The sperm must have a, a full complement of 23 chromosomes and will not be able to swim uh, through the cervix, up through the uterus, and into the fallopian tube to penetrate the ova unless it is perfect. Uh, that's a long trip. And unless the, the sperm uh, has a proper amount of uh, energy behind it, uh, it's never going to make it. And uh, if it's not a perfect uh, sperm, then it will not be able to penetrate the, uh, the ova. Uh, so this is what we're looking for. This is one of the reasons why males produce so many sperm every second. Uh, we're, we're creating thousands of sperm every second. And the reason is because um, there is a great need to produce good ones. Uh, this can be a problem. I think we're going to talk about that, are we? Uh, no, we're not going to talk about that. So let me talk about it right now. One of the problems with... It, and, and, you know, we, we keep arguing about this stuff. And uh, the people that are, are the drug apologists uh, keep telling us, hey, uh, it's okay. <laughs> uh, sperm's natural. Or sperm. uh, marijuana is natural, man. But the reality is that, uh, that marijuana distorts your, your sperm. Uh, can you use it as a birth control uh, measure? No, it doesn't work that way. Uh, you're more likely to uh, produce off uh, to produce uh, uh, zygotes that uh, don't survive. Uh, so they would they would never make it to term. Uh, so there's a lot of abnormal forms that have to do with marijuana. There's a lot of abnormal forms that have to do with a lot of the toxins that we that we consume. It's one of the reasons why alcoholics don't uh, produce lots and lots of children uh, is because it distorts their their sperm, if they're male, I mean, of course. <laughs> uh, the ova must have its uh, full complement of 23 chromosomes and be in the right position when the sperm reaches it. So there's a lot of lot of things that have to take place, um, and, and it needs to be a perfect sperm, and it needs to be a perfect ova for it to be fertilized. If it is not perfect, uh, e if either the ova or, and this is one of the reasons why when uh, people have fertility problems, they're trying to figure out what the problem is. There's lots of different factors that, that take place. Um, is her uh, uterus preparing itself for implantation properly? Are her hormones at the, at the right level? Uh, is he producing enough sperm to potentially impregnate her? Um, you know, all of these things are factors and, and of course that's one of the reasons why uh, uh, why, when we're we're dealing with fertility, uh, that they look at a lot of different uh, a lot of different aspects. 
For implantation to take place, the uterine wall must be ready for implantation. The zygote must implant near the top of the uterus. Adequate vascularization must take place between the embryo and the uterus. Growth and cell division must take place in a continual and a balanced pattern. And of course, this, uh, a lot of this has to do with what in the world is the young lady doing at this time. Uh, if she's healthy, if she exercises regularly, uh, then, then probably everything's going to turn out okay. Uh, but if she is a smoker or a drinker, uh, one of the problems with smoking, of course, is that it's a vasoconstrictor. And uh, so if she smokes, if she's a chain smoker, uh, then, then what she is doing is uh, uh, starving the uh, embryo for blood. Uh, because every time she uh, smokes a cigarette, it constricts her blood vessels. And it re restricts the amount of blood getting into the uh, into the, the baby, into the zygote, into the embryo, into the fetus. <clears throat> if she's a drinker, of course, uh, alcohol is toxic, and, uh, and that can, can change everything. And, of course, if she smokes marijuana, and we haven't really dealt with that. Uh, no one's really looked at that yet uh, as to... Uh, we, we know that the male fertility is reduced. We know that the female fertility is reduced if, if she smokes uh, marijuana. Uh, but we, we're not exactly sure what happens uh, to the fetus like we do with, with cigarettes because so many people smoke cigarettes. It's easy uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to look at the, uh, the outcome and to uh, judge it by how much um, the individual smokes. Anyway, okay, well... Let's stop talking about negative things. <laughs> as soon as the sperm penetrates the ova, the structure becomes a zygote. Uh, within 12 hours, a single cell divides into two cells. Within two weeks, the zygote becomes an embryo and divides into three distinct layers. And, of course, it has to implant a uh, high... Wait a minute, let me get my arrow. There we go. It has to implant here. If it implants down lower uh, in the uterus, then it, it probably will be miscarried at some point. Uh, that's just too dangerous. It needs to implant as high as it possibly can. Uh, in the old days, we used to try to, to uh, when I was working in medicine, we used to try to guess whether somebody was have, going to have a, uh, a male or a female baby. And uh, one of the things that we noted is that females carry... They carry males uh, higher than they carry females. That's one of the things we, we noted. And we were right about 80% of the time, which is not too bad. I'm saying we, uh, the reality is I was right about 80% of the time. Okay, so we've created a zygote, and the zygote is going to uh, divide into three distinct layers. The nervous system develops from the outer layer of the three layers, uh, the ectoderm, uh, the ectoderm grows into a flat oval plate. Uh, the cells of the plate do not grow at the same rate, and a groove develops. This groove is known as the primitive streak, and this will become the central nervous system. As the cells continue to divide, the groove slowly grows into the neural tube, the front of the anterior portion of the tube. The, the front or the anterior portion of the tube uh, divides into three structures that will become the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. By the eighth week of gestation, the fetus has developed all the rudimentary organs in its body. Uh, the brain at this time takes up uh, one half of the fetus's mass. The brain will continue to grow through the teenage years. Uh, now, there is a new abortion law in, uh, in Texas. And they say you can't get an abortion after the sixth week of gestation. Um, they say that you can't uh, abort a fetus after the heart starts beating. Uh, and uh, at this point, uh, the heart is, is very primitive. Uh, there is a primitive heartbeat uh, to some extent at, eighth, at the eighth week. Six weeks is a little early for, for all of this to, to be taking place. The nervous system develops, uh, development takes place in six stages. Uh, neurogenesis, the formation of the neurons. Uh, cell migration, movement of neurons to form nerve cell uh, populations. Uh, differentiation, development of distinctive types of neurons. 
synaptogenesis, uh, development of synaptic connections as axons and dendrites grow, uh, neuronal cell death, uh, selective death of neurons, uh, synapse rearrangement, definement, uh, refinement of sy synaptic connections. Now, one of the interesting things that, that takes place is that things grow, and then when you don't need them anymore, they 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 get taken out. They get they die. Uh, the neurons self destruct, and they're gone. And uh, all all of the material. Uh, for that neuron goes back into the system and it's manufactured as something else. Uh, that's that's the way it works. Uh, when you need something, it's there. Uh, if you don't need it anymore, it uh, it dies uh, and, and it gets reabsorbed uh, into the brain. <clears throat> and and we're going to find out that uh, the uh, fetus or the the uh, uh, baby is born, the neonate. Uh, is born with with a lot of different instincts that we don't seem to need anymore, uh, grasping and and whatnot. Swimming, we have the ability to swim. Our babies have the ability to swim at birth. Um, once upon a time, that was probably it was probably necessary for all newborns to be able to uh, to paddle around. But the real, but they lose that. They, though all those in instincts will will go away eventually. And the reason they go away is because of this uh, neuronal cell death, the selective death of neurons. Uh, that instinct, which is there is a uh, brain connection uh, taking place, uh, that connection is, is broken because the neurons are killed or they die uh, because you don't need that instinct. And if you don't use it, you lose it. And that's exactly what happens. All of those instincts are gone. The first stage of nerve system development is neurogenesis. Uh, this is when the nerve cells are produced. Uh, nerve cells themselves do not divide, but uh, pre-nerve cells, which are located in the inner layer of the neural tube, do divide and create a closely packed layer of cells called the ventricular zone. The cells of the ventricular zone continue to divide and, and give rise to daughter cells, which are which also divide. All the body's neurons and glial cells are derived from ventricular mitosis. Uh, neural cells will be completely developed by birth. Each neural structure in the brain will develop at the same time in gestation for all humans. Neurons of the developing nervous system are always on the move. Uh, during the cell migration stage, the cells of the, the, uh, the cells of the ventricular layer begin to move uh, where they will end up. In humans and other primates, by birth, all of the neuronal cells will have found their way to where they will always be. Some neurons will creep down glial cells known as radial glial cells. <clears throat> Neurons can either move down the glial cells or jump from one to the next. Uh, this migration is guided by various chemicals called cell adhesion molecules. Uh, the cerebrum is formed by wave after wave of neurons till the entire cerebral cortex is formed. And we're going to see these waves. They, they, uh, they come in layers, and, and there are, are six distinct layers of, of the, uh, the cerebral cortex and the cerebrum. Once uh, the preneuronal cells reach their destination, genes in the cells begin to make the protein that are required uh, by neurons. At this point, the neurons begin differentiating. <laughs> begin differentiating into the distinctive neurons of the region that they are in. Most neuronal cells differentiate through induction. Uh, they take on the task of all their neighboring cells. Uh, some cells are undifferentiated cells and will differentiate into any cells that they are close to. And these are known as stem cells. And there's a lot of argument about stem cells. There's a lot of argument about stem cells because the idea is that we, if we took these stem cells, then potentially we could put them someplace that needs to be repaired, and it would repair a really serious problem. Um, they have uh, thought that they could potentially do this with uh, uh, stem cells and uh, uh, the, uh, 
dopamine producing cells in the substantia nigra. This is where uh, they have a problem with uh, with Parkinson's disease. Uh, I just had a um, my running mate, the, the individual that uh, actually he was, he was the fastest guy on the on the relay team. He just died of Parkinson's disease about six weeks ago. Uh, really a shock because uh, this was this was uh, one of the finest athletes I've ever I've ever encountered in my life. And uh, he died of Parkinson's disease at, at 72. Um, real shock uh, to everybody. He's in the Hall of Fame, at the, my college's Hall of Fame. Just a fabulous athlete. And he died of Parkinson's disease. Now, potentially, uh, stem cells, you know, if, if this were legal, it became illegal uh, under the Bush administration, and nobody's done anything about it since. It seems to have had a, a religious reason as to why he felt that uh, stem cells should not be used for research. Um, but uh, potentially, it, you could implant stem cells in that area and repair uh, the dopamine-producing cells. In other words, you'd produce more dopamine. Uh, they would continue to produce dopamine because uh, it's the degeneration of the dopamine producing cells that causes Parkinson's disease. If somebody had a, uh, a damaged uh, spinal cord, uh, potentially that, that caused them to be paraplegic or quadriplegic, uh, you could uh, put stem cells uh, where the damage is and they would repair the, uh, the spinal cord. That's the assumption. We can't do it because there is no, uh, that type of Research isn't allowed in the United States, so it hasn't happened yet. When neurons migrate to their final destination, they start the process of synaptogenesis. Axons and dendrites begin to web out, <clears throat> making contact with the cells that they are going to be responding to. This is done through swollen ends of dendrites and axons called growth cones. The growth cones uh, reach out using fine filaments uh, known as filopodia, the filaments are known as filopodia or plates, and the plates are known as lamellopodia. Growth cones are drawn by chemical signals called chemoattractants. Uh, growth cones can also be repelled by chemical signals called chemorepellents. As adults, we maintain synaptogenesis structures, dendritic uh, growth cones, axonic uh, chemo. Ch chemo attractants, and chemorepellents. Synapses uh, can form rapidly on dendrites and dendritic spines. Uh, the number of spines increase rapidly after birth and are affected by experience. Neuronal cell death, known as apoptosis, is crucial to the brain development, especially during the embryonic stages. Neuronal cell death ranges from 20 to 80 percent, varying from region to region of the brain and spinal cord. Uh, if it wasn't for uh, uh, apoptosis, uh, you would be born uh, with, uh, if, if you maintained all of, all of your neurons that you are born with, uh, without uh, apoptosis, uh, then you would be born with a much, much larger brain, as you can see, 20 to 80 percent. So, and, and most of those brain cells you would not use. An area needs only to so many neurons and synapses. And as the area grows, more neurons than are needed flood into the area to ensure that the most perfect neuronal structure and synapse are created. The cells that die are self-selecting to die. They are committing suicide. All cells carry a death gene that causes a sudden influx and release of, of calcium ions that cause the mitochondria to release a protein called Diablo. Diablo is Spanish for the devil. Diablo binds the inhibitors of, ap uh, of apoptosis proteins, the IAPs, that have been uh, inhibiting a family of proteins called caspases, and it's the caspases that break it down. Uh, the caspases are proteases or enzymes that dissolve protein. Uh, the caspases break down the protein and the DNA of the neuron. Uh, normally, Diablo is inhibited by BCL2. Uh, cells that are, are able to make proper and adequate synaptic connections are the ones that live while those that don't die rather than make a poor connection. Chemicals that enable proper growth are called neurotropic factors. 
And here's a little joke. Integrating signals hitting at his obsolescence, George undergoes apoptosis and his brain explodes. Not possible. <clears throat> Scientists have discovered a substance that promotes the growth of spinal ganglia that they call nerve growth factor. If a technique uh, could be developed to use nerve growth factor effectively, spinal injuries could be repaired back to normal function. But of course, that hasn't happened yet. With time and experience, some synapses disengage and other synapses are formed. This process is especially prevalent during cell death in the area, refining the remaining synapses to provide optimum connections. While neurons and glial cells develop from the same source cells, scientists don't know what informs the cells to end up as one or the other. While neuronal growth takes place almost exclusively, before birth, glial cells have their greatest growth surge right after birth and continue to grow throughout life. The glial cells provide myelin for the axons of the neuron. Uh, myelin protects, feeds, and accelerates the electrical responses uh, on the neuron. Uh, myelination allows people to walk with coordination and the brain to process information rapidly. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease that affects select individuals. Uh, the condition allows the immune system to attack the myelin of the neurons and leave gaps in the structure that slows the neuronal response. And that's one of the reasons why uh, people uh, with multiple sclerosis lose the ability to walk. Now, uh, something else has happened uh, now that we now that COVID has uh, the pandemic has hit. One of the things that we are, are are realizing is that your immune system is really quite delicate. Uh, normally, well, normally, um, we have evolved to the point where a lot of people with autoimmune problems, a lot of people with immune problems, uh, have survived and are surviving, and there's no reason for them not to survive. Uh, but COVID seems to be gleaning a lot of these people uh, out. Uh, in other words, people with any problems whatsoever, uh, if they catch COVID, uh, it's very difficult for them to fight it off. Uh, people with diabetes, of course, um, alcoholics uh, with, uh, with, with that problem, uh, people with autoimmune diseases seem to be dying more readily uh, from COVID uh, than people uh, that don't have any immune problems. So uh, in, in order to fight off COVID, um, the, the human population seems to, to need a, uh, a, a very active and a, a very um, uh, developed, well-developed immune system. And this is something that we are, are noticing. It was a bit of a shock. Uh, we don't really think about these things uh, because uh, everybody has a right to survive, of course. Uh, but uh, COVID seems to uh, be taking uh, the individuals with any problems at all. And autoimmune problems are, are part of the problem. People with, with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, which is an autoimmune disease. People with uh, lupus, people uh, that uh, um, have asthma. Uh, these are all uh, autoimmune problems uh, that uh, that signal the fact that the immune system isn't isn't uh, as strong as it as it potentially could be, and and these are the individuals that seem to be dying from COVID uh, more readily than anybody else. Of course, their uh, COVID takes anybody that it can, uh, but uh, um, the people that have uh, other problems uh, seem to be the ones that are more susceptible uh, to the effects of, of COVID-19. Real shock to the medical community because uh, medicine is, is, uh, is practiced by, uh, by habit. Uh, you treat this person, you treat all, all heart disease the same way. You know, every, everything has a formula to it. And uh, COVID has just uh, really disrupted all of those formulas that the uh, medical community has been developing for a number of, uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, so this is, this is a, a real shock to a lot of people. Uh, we didn't expect this. Um, COVID has, has, is now the, the worst pandemic that we've ever, that we've ever seen. Worse than the uh, Spanish flu. The Spanish flu seemed to have burned itself out, but COVID it just keeps mutating and uh, 
uh, into different forms. And, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the vaccination, the people that are vaccinated seem to have some degree of protection. But, of course, uh, it, we may need uh, booster shots in the future. Uh, we're dealing with Delta, with the Delta variant right now. But there's a Lambda variant down uh, in Chile and Peru that, uh, that uh, may be even worse than the Delta <clears throat> so it's it's really kind of fascinating. Well, it's not for you, of course. <laughs> uh, it's kind of fascinating for me because I've worked with this uh, in my medical career. We work with immunity, and uh, it's really interesting. I've, we we never anticipated something like this would happen. Intrinsic factors in the development of the nervous system deal with the genetic factors that allow for proper development. When genetic aberrations occur, it can cause abnormal uh, brain development. Tay-Sachs disease causes the destruction of neurons that eventually results in death. It has been identified as a flaw on the 15th chromosome. Tay-Sachs disease is endemic, uh, is a, uh, a relatively rare disease. It uh, only affects uh, Ashkenazi Jews. Um, they, they have... Through mutation, they have developed this problem. Uh, there's a lot of intermarrying in the uh, in the uh, the Jewish population, uh, mainly because they weren't allowed to to marry outside the religion, uh, not by their religion, but by uh, by every uh, by other uh, groups. They pe people have ghettoized them. They've isolated them, and uh, now we have this repeating problem that. Uh, that causes problems. Down syndrome causes intellectual disability and body abnormalities. It has been identified as an extra chromosome on the 21st pair. Extrinsic factors include malnutrition, fetal alcohol syndrome, hypoxia-induced intellectual disability. Hypoxia is a uh, lack of oxygen. Sometimes as the baby uh, comes through the birth canal, it starts breathing early and uh, too early. Uh, normally, it's, uh, there is a state of, of shock, and that's one of the reasons why the baby, uh, uh, they have to, to induce the baby to breathe the for, for the first time, needs to take a breath, uh, because it's in a state of shock, and that's because uh, going through the birth canal is, is fairly traumatic for the infant. So they have to, to get the baby to breathe. Uh, but if the baby starts breathing inside the birth canal, there's not a whole lot of oxygen down there, and they start suffer, They may potentially suffer from hypoxia. This doesn't happen very often. Uh, if it does start to happen, then, then usually the, uh, the physician will either take the baby uh, cesarean or uh, use some other method uh, to get the baby out. Uh, usually it's forceps or, or a, a suction device. Uh, to pull the baby through the birth canal. Um, so that's one of the reasons why having a physician uh, available uh, during, the, uh, during the birth is not a bad idea. Usually nothing happens. I mean, 90, 95% of the time nothing happens. But I, I used to work in uh, a children's hospital in Omaha, and uh, uh, we we got all the difficult cases, so it was really kind of interesting to to watch the whole process, uh, because uh, if if somebody uh, they they knew that somebody was going to have difficulty uh, delivering a baby, uh, they would always send them to to Children's Hospital rather than I mean they've got a specialist right there, and of course uh, we we did everything we could to to help to help mother and baby. The sum of the intrinsic factors are referred to as the genotype. The genotype plus the extrinsic factors uh, represent an individual's phenotype. So what you can see is the phenotype, and what is hidden is the genotype. Uh, I'm talking mostly uh, about uh, blood factors. Uh, I, I cross-matched a lot of blood in my time. And uh, the phenotype is, is the blood type that you see, or A positive. Uh, but sometimes people have factors that, are, that you can't see, that you have to test for. Uh, and you have to make sure that that, that is not going to cause a problem uh, if you transfuse a, a select type of blood. So if somebody's O positive, uh, they may be an O positive with, with, a, with a genotype of G. Uh, and 
if you try to give them just O positive blood without the G factor, uh, then potentially what will happen is they will have a reaction to the, uh, to the blood. Uh, so if they have that G factor, which is relatively rare, it's, uh, uh, it's a sub-Asian uh, sub, uh, uh, factor that, that is rarely seen in the United States. Uh, but, but you have to test for it because if somebody has uh, uh, Asian Indian ancestry or they're from Bangladesh or they're from Sri Lanka, uh, then they may potentially have this, uh, this odd uh, blood factor that, that needs to be factored in. That's the genotype is what is hidden and the phenotype is what you see. Uh, so if you have uh, brown eyes, uh, then you are your phenotype is brown eyes, but uh, potentially you have a blue-eyed uh, uh, gene. Uh, so if you uh, reproduce, then potentially you will have a baby. If you reproduce to somebody with blue eyes, then uh, there's a 50-50 there's a chance that you will, uh, that you will have blue-eyed offspring. And that would be the genotype. Uh, when mutations take place in a species' genetic history, the mutation uh, most often creates a maladaptive circumstances. And this is what we're seeing with COVID. Uh, COVID started out with the Alpha variant, and then there was the British variant, which became known as the Beta variant. Uh, what happened? So what happened uh, to the virus? Well, viruses replicate very rapidly. And since they're replicating so, so rapidly, uh, the ones that survive are going to be the ones that are the hardiest. Uh, so if uh, there is a mutation that, that uh, uh, doesn't hurt people, uh, then potentially it'll just go away. But if there is a uh, mutation uh, that makes it more likely that it will survive, that mutation is going to take over. And that's what's happened with the beta variant, this British variant uh, that we saw uh, right after COVID started. And now with the Delta variant that came out of uh, uh, Asia, came out of uh, India. And with the lambda variant that we see down in uh, down in South America, uh, what is what happened was that it's a more virulent form, and since it's more virulent, it's more likely to replicate itself. And since it's more contagious, these new variants are more contagious. These are the ones that uh, that uh, tend to be spread. <clears throat> and of course, what the vir virus is trying to do is infect people so that it can survive. That's you know. It's a, it's a vir viral's uh, uh, survival technique. So that's one of the reasons why the Delta variant is why it is killing so many people is because it is more it not is not only more virulent but it's more easily spread. And the lambda, of course, uh, doesn't seem to be uh, quite that bad. But uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see if there's another mutation uh, because viruses replicate very very rapidly. Uh, just like bacteria do. Uh, if you plant a bacteria on a petri dish uh, in an enriched media, uh, then it will start growing within hours. Uh, and what it's actually doing is reproducing in there, and it's, it's forming colonies. And you can take those colonies and plant them someplace else, and then they'll grow. If you just let that, pl that uh, plate sit, that, uh, that uh, petri dish, if you, if you just let it sit, eventually it will reproduce to the, fat, the, the point that it, there's no more food uh, and uh, it will, uh, it will, everything will die. And that's kind of what happened with the, with the influenza virus. The influenza virus replicates very rapidly. Usually it doesn't have time to mutate because it's only a matter of, of, of months uh, that, uh, that people are infected with the, the flu. It's killed off by summertime. It's killed off by heat. Uh, so uh, you, you, there are influenza deaths during the summertime, but it's, it's not that common. It's more likely uh, when you're indoors, you know, everybody's inside, they don't want to go outside, so the air recirculates and uh, the, the, the virus gets into the, into the air. Uh, that's when influenza really hits. But influenza, obviously, is not nearly as virulent as the COVID-19. Um, we have seen COVID before, of course. COVID-19 is just the, one, the variant that came out uh, in 2019. Uh, when I was stationed in Germany, we had a COVID outbreak uh, that they referred to as walking pneumonia. 
uh, and uh, we were able to isolate it and keep it from replicating going anywhere. Uh, but uh, uh, <clears throat> it was it's kind of interesting. It wasn't nearly as bad as as the variant uh, as COVID nineteen, but it was it was a COVID. It was a uh, uh, virus uh, that uh, started in your your uh, esophagus, it, and it was low in the esophagus, right above your your lungs. Uh, that and they called it walking pneumonia. <clears throat> Experience is an important factor in brain development. Uh, the brain, uh, human brain, is only one fourth its adult size at birth, yet few neurons are added. The reason for the exceptional growth is due to dendrite uh, growth and myelination. Dendrite growth and myelination are induced by experience with the various muscles and sensory organs of the body. One form of extrinsic stimulation causing a problem is amblyopia. Also called walleye and lazy eye, children with, uh, with the problem have a misalignment of the balance of their binocular vision. If uh, left untreated by age 7 or 8, the suppressed eye will totally blind. And of course, that's what's potentially happening to this individual. I have a niece with uh, amblyopia. The reason she has amblyopia is because her mother uh, would lay her down on the couch to watch television and give her her bottle. So she had one eye covered and one eye watching television. She always laid down on her right side. They never put her on her other side. Uh, so one of her eyes became a lazy eye. And eventually, of course, it had to be treated. And now, of course, she has to wear, wear glasses. But she has one eye that focuses uh, very poorly, uh, her right eye focuses very poorly. While treatment in uh, childhood will result in perfect vision, when the problem is corrected in adulthood, the eye does not gain acute vision. And that's what's happened with this individual. Uh, my wife uh, had uh, a lazy eye when she was born. And of course, her, her parents were uh, fixed it. They, they were quite adamant about, uh, about her uh, doing her exercises, and she doesn't have a problem today. Uh, this is because when the problem is allowed to remain the same over time, the neural connections in the brain from the weak eye are not uh, as intricate. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, as people uh, become adults, uh, their brains become more hardwired. Once their brains become hardwired, it's difficult to fix it, those neurons. Uh, no longer exist, and it's very difficult to fix uh, the problem. Understanding uh, of amblyopia and other asymmetrically uh, balanced neural connections has been studied by performing binocular deprivation research on laboratory animals. This is first done with a cat. <clears throat> and now, of course, we understand how this works. Uh, so if you block a, uh, uh, one of the uh, cat's eyes, uh, then they will actually go blind in that eye. We had a cat that uh, had a, a milky eye. One of its eyes, uh, it had cataracts or something when it was uh, just a kitten, and it never developed binocular vision. <clears throat> and even if they had done their, and, and this is what the vet said, that even if we had done uh, an operation to, to correct the uh, the cataracts, uh, as an adult, uh, the cat would never regain uh, binocular vision. So there was no reason to do it. Researchers have discovered that sensory organs have a sensitive period, period when the neural development is crucial for stimulation to induce proper dendritic connections. If stimulation does not occur by this time, recovery to a normal state is impossible. And this is one of the reasons why you need uh, to maintain a, a degree of stimulation uh, for your offspring uh, so that they will develop normally. Uh, everything develop normally. Now, of course, uh, this ten tends to happen, uh, but sometimes, and, and one of the worries now is that, uh, that people are on media for such a long time, uh, even as children uh, playing video games and whatnot, uh, there's always a possibility that something isn't going to be developed properly. Uh, you know, we'll uh, we lose the ability to uh, uh, to play baseball. Will we lose the ability to play football? Will we lose the ability uh, to run fast? Um, I set uh, 
when I was running track in college uh, 50 years ago, uh, we set a record that has never been broken. Now, why in the world haven't they been able to put four guys together that can run, that ran as fast as we did? Even though they've improved the shoes, they've improved the, the track is better, much better than it used to be. They've in, in, uh, improved the timing, uh, yet they nobody has been able to break our record. Uh, is it because uh, uh, people today get less stimulation uh, to run? Uh, they're not sprinting around. They're not chasing each other. <clears throat> is this the reason that uh, that uh, no one has been able to break our record, or is it just the fact that we are we were all four supermen, <laughs> and that's why the record was set so low that they can't break it. Uh, to understand why people tend to have dominant eyes, it must be remembered that each eye represents millions of receptors vying for attention in the brain. <clears throat> when one eye receives more stimulation than the other, uh, some, of the, some of the synapses in the brain connected uh, to the unstimulated eye become weaker. Uh, while most uh, synapses do not fluctuate in their strength of stimulation, some do. These synapses are known as Hebbian synapses. And that's what happens with the eye. 75 years ago, the leading cause of intellectual disability in the United States was phenylketonuria, also known as PKU. About 2% of the population carries the recessive gene. Uh, this gene is prevalent in, in a select group of individuals. Uh, those individuals are Caucasian. Uh, they have this gene. Uh, it is rarely seen uh, in other uh, populations uh, unless they have white ancestry. The gene controls the enzyme that breaks down phenylalanine, an amino acid and protein. Because the enzyme does not break down the phenylalanine, a toxic level collects in the brain and it destroys brain cells, creating an intellectual disability. Um, but we test for this. Uh, we test uh, newborn babies to find out if there is uh, they have too much of this this phenylketonuria in their uh, in their blood. Uh, the first time, and, and it has to do with breaking down proteins. Um, milk, of course, is a protein. So one of the things that has to happen is we test them, uh, but we have to wait until they have had their first uh, meal of milk. Uh, so uh, usually with the within the first twenty four hours, if if they have PKU, they need to. Uh, we need to start them on this uh, uh, a, a diet that, that takes out all the phenylalanine, which means they won't be able to drink milk, uh, but at least they, they will survive without any intellectual disability. <clears throat> so we, we test babies for this, and we test every baby that is born in the United States, unless they're born at home and, uh, uh, and the uh, parents don't go to the doctor. Don't take the baby to the doctor soon after the baby is born. Williams syndrome is a relatively rare genetic abnormality that causes neural and facial abnormalities, as well as mild intellectual disability. Research indicates that William, Williams syndrome is caused by an incomplete chromosomal structure on the seventh chromosome. These individuals have normal linguish, linguistic ability, but difficulty in learning by observing. And this is what somebody with Williams syndrome looks like. As you can see, the brain is a different shape. Individuals with Williams syndrome have very characteristic facial features. They have broad foreheads, small eye openings, a low uh, nasal bridge, uh, nostrils that point forward, uh, pug nose, uh, long uh, area between the nose and the upper lip, full cheeks, large uh, downturned mouth. Uh, and as you, these are people with Williams syndrome, <clears throat> and as you can see, they they all look like uh, they're related to one another. Actually, they have this this one problem, this uh, Williams syndrome. The other thing about people with Williams syndrome is um, they are happy. They are they have this strange uh, desire, that, or or they see everything in a a, a positive form. Um, they uh, and they don't. You can insult them and they don't get it. They they won't get the insult. You can say mean things to them and they won't. They won't understand what you're talking about. 
<clears throat> as you can see, the, the uh, cerebrum, the cerebellum is, is larger in the person with uh, Williams syndrome. Rest of the brain looks about the same, but you've got this huge cerebellum. <clears throat> and they all look alike. They all look like their brothers and sisters. Down syndrome is a condition caused by the addition of an extra chromosome among the 21st pair of chromosomes. Hence, it's, called, it's a trisomy because there are three chromosomes. Uh, this abnormality can cause mild to severe intellectual disability and various physical an anomalies, usually heart malformations and brittle arteries, that lead to a shortened life expectancy. Um, however, um, with concentrated efforts, uh, these individuals can live into their 70s. Uh, there's an individual on the Fort Belknap Reservation who's in his 60s now, and everybody was a, a bit surprised. Uh, when he was first born with Down syndrome, uh, the, the, his parents were told that he probably wouldn't make it into his 20s. But of course, they, they treated him like they treated everybody else, uh, rather than put him in an institution, which used to happen, uh, especially when this kid was born. Uh, they used to put these kids in, the, uh, in institutions. You didn't have to, to, to uh, take care of them. You could, you could give them to the state. Uh, and that happened a lot. And of course, those kids did without stimulation, uh, without concentrated effort to uh, uh, to create uh, their intellectual uh, capacity. Uh, they they died young. Uh, but uh, the individual on the Fort Belknap Reservation, he's known as the mayor because everybody, when he goes to powwows, everybody loves him. He's just a great, great guy. One time I was at a, a powwow at Fort Belknap, and uh, he had met me the uh, the powwow before. We had we had shaken hands, and uh, there were select families that uh, that uh, would uh, that I hung around with at at powwows, uh, and I helped them with uh, making food and stuff. Um, and uh, he saw me at this one powwow, and they were having a dance. And he saw me, and he yelled across, uh, he cr across the uh, the uh, dance floor. He yelled at me, and he said, "Hey, uh, I'm over here." Uh, and I started to go around. He said, "No, no, no!" And he just cut right across all the dancers. <laughs> and of course, you know, it's the mayor. So I mean, whatever is anybody going to do anyway? Uh, he uh, walked through, the, and everybody's laughing, and they. Uh, and he came over and gave me a big hug. It was really, really kind of sweet. Uh, anyway, yeah, he, we were, we were buddies. Trisomy 21 is more prevalent in older women, probably because of the age of the ova. Uh, one of the things you need to remember is that uh, all sperm are fresh uh, because men are making sperm on a continual basis. Uh, but all ova are are the age of the woman because a woman is born with all the ovaries she will ever have. Uh, so the longer that she waits to uh, reproduce, uh, the older that the ova is, and the more, the greater the probability that there can potentially be a problem. Here's the 21st chromosome, and as you can see, there are three. Uh, this is a, where's the 23rd chromosome? Where is the 23rd chromosome? The 23rd chromosome. Oh, there it is. This is the 23rd chromosome. This is a female. You can see the two X chromosomes. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> I can't count. Ah, uh, yeah. Th these are the two X chromosomes. <clears throat> Research shows that individuals with trisomy 21 have abnormal formations of their dendritic spines, making it more difficult for these individuals to learn. Uh, but of course, this all depends on, on how bad it is. Uh, the most frequent uh, form of inherited intellectual disability today is fragile X syndrome. Uh, the DNA of this select chromosome seems more pinched and fragile, uh, more likely to break off. Uh, the real problem seems to be an excessively repeated trinucleotide that is in abundance four times normal, uh, thus causing the extended appearance of the chromosome. And these are two X chromosomes. This is a little girl, and as you can see, this is the fragile portion of the, uh, uh, of the chromosome. Uh, 
as you, it's right down here. Uh, individuals with this genetic disorder, they have normal stature, uh, they have broad foreheads, uh, elongated faces, large prominent uh, ears, uh, strabismus, they have crossed eyes, uh, highly arched palate, uh, hyperextendable joints. Uh, hand calluses, uh, usually it's from uh, self-abuse, uh, pectus, uh, excavatum, uh, they, they have an indentation in their chest, really kind of fascinating. Pectus, uh, excavatum, indentation of the chest, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, mitral valve prolapse, benign heart conditions, enlarged testicles if they're males, of course, uh, hypotonia, low muscle tone, soft fleshy skin, flat feet, and seizures in about 10% of the individual's suffering from this. Uh, now, as we see here, of course, you can have fragile X if you're a little girl, uh, but uh, it's, it tends to be more severe. The intellectual disability tends to be more severe in males than in females. And one of the reasons is, and of course, we haven't talked about this yet, uh, but the X chromosome, as you can see, the X chromosome is quite large. Uh, the uh, Y chromosome, the male chromosome, uh, if this were a little boy, uh, he'd have a Y chromosome. It's much smaller. It's about this size. That's it right there. And, of course, if there's a problem on the, the mother's X chromosome, uh, then uh, all, all uh, ova are female. Uh, so they're, they're all X chromosome. It's the, uh, it's the male sperm that decides the gender of the, uh, of the offspring. <clears throat> so if it's a male... It, and the chromosome is only this large, and there's a defect on the uh, on the X chromosome, uh, then uh, then there's nothing. It doesn't can't cancel it out. But of course, if it's uh, if it's a little girl, then uh, they have the proper uh, chromosomes to cancel out any other problems, except the the fragile X. So this this portion down here isn't duplicated over here. Uh, but if she has any other problems on the uh, uh, on the chromosome, it can be canceled out by the by the father's uh, chromosome. Here's the bizarre part. As you can see, this is more wrinkled than this one. This is a this is a fresh chromosome. It's because <laughs> it's because this is an ova's chromosome, and an ova, of course, women are born with all the the ova that they will ever have. <clears throat> and I'm having a cat fight. My cat wants out. Just a second. Just one sec. Sorry. <clears throat> Fresh and, and, and stale, I guess. Is, <clears throat> that's not, that's re, not very nice. The, but the reality is that, that uh, ova, a woman is born with all the ova she'll ever have. About 40% of children born to alcoholic mothers show a distinctive profile of anatomical, physiological, and behavioral impairments known as fetal alcohol syndrome. And this is what a normal bra baby's brain looks like. And this is what a baby's brain who is born. This is what the baby's brain looks like uh, with fetal alcohol syndrome. As you can see, the convolutions of the Solsi and gyri uh, are not as extreme. Uh, it's a much smaller brain. Uh, we're going to look at the corpus callosum in just a second. But this is fetal alcohol syndrome and what it looks like. Children suffering uh, with uh, fetal alcohol syndrome show stunted growth and select facial an uh, anomalies. Uh, their brain is, is smaller. They're, they have small eye sockets, uh, flat midface, distinctive philtrum. Uh, the philtrum is the uh, between the nose and the upper lip. Uh, normally, you can see a crease right there. Uh, these individuals don't have that. They don't have that crease. Uh, and that's known as a philtrum, indistinct philtrum. <clears throat> uh, thin upper lip, uh, small chin, short nose, lowered ears, uh, low nasal bridge, uh, epicanthic fold on the eyelids. Um, the epicanthic fold is a, a layer of fat uh, under the eyelid. 
Brain impairment is due to their small brain and brain structure problems like the almost absent corpus callosum. Uh, this is a normal uh, individual's brain. Uh, this is the brain of a, a child suffering from uh, FAS. As you can see, the corpus callosum, this is it right here. These two little, little nibs are all there is. It's supposed to look like this. And it looks like this. <clears throat> uh, and reduction of cerebral uh, cortical gyri, uh, the folds of the brain that gives it more surface. And as you can see, it's a much smaller brain, and there aren't nearly as many folds as there are in a normal brain. Intellectual disability can be mild to severe, possibly depending on the time during pregnancy and the level of consumption. Besides intellectual disability, children with FAS also show uh, such neurological abnormalities such as hyperactivity, uh, irritability, and tremulousness. Uh, a lot of times a child suffering from FAS or FAE uh, is diagnosed with uh, ADHD. Uh, the reality is it is an effect of the, uh, uh, of the, the alcohol. Studies also seem to indicate that marijuana may have the same effects as alcohol, but we are not exactly sure. Autism spectrum disorder is a lifelong developmental di uh, disorder that is characterized by slight to severe social impairment and language. 70% of uh, children with ASD develop poor language skills, rarely getting beyond monosyllabic uh, responses and echolalia. <clears throat> this, a lot of this has to do with how much uh, stimulation the uh, individual gets. Uh, with concentrated effort, uh, this this figure is going way, way down, and uh, that's what they're training parents to do. If they have a child with autism spectrum disorder, uh, they are training them uh, to interact with them more, uh, to get them to uh, verbalize things. Um, and it was, it was like 20 years ago that 70% uh, of children uh, develop poor language skills. Now this, this number has gone way, way down. And the reason is because we have figured out that if you spend time with these individuals, if you concentrate on what's going on, they can develop almost normally. Now they're not going to develop normally because there are brain structures that won't allow that to happen. However, they can uh, develop uh, almost normally and they, uh, with concentrated effort by the parents, uh, they will be uh, fairly uh, uh, self-functioning. ASD uh, doesn't have to correspond with any mental deficiency, but the lack of social interaction may impair the diagnosis, and that is the basic problem. Normally, uh, when an individual meets a stranger, they scan their faces for recognition and potentially put this information in their long-term memory. However, individuals with uh, autism spectrum disorder show brain scans where they seek no recognition and therefore have a difficult time making new acquaintances. And this is, uh, there are lots of different uh, degrees of uh, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, some are, are, are relatively weak. Uh, others are, are really, really strong, where the individual um, uh, can make no eye contact whatsoever. Uh, autism spectrum disorder seems to have something to do with brain organization. Particularly, all information is organized differently from a normal control. AS, uh, autism spectrum disorder seems to affect from one to two children per thousand. Uh, it is far more common among male children than female children and seems to run in families. Various areas of the brain show abnormalities among uh, autism spectrum disorder children, including the corpus callosum. Uh, autism spectrum disorder, formerly called Asperger's syndrome, seems to be a less severe form of uh, autism spectrum disorder where the individual does not suffer from language deficits but has problems with social interactions. I had a friend in college who had Asperger's, a uh, really fascinating guy. This guy was brilliant. Uh, he, could, uh, uh, he could be sitting in the middle of a, of a wild party reading a book. I mean, that's the, the concentration that this guy had. Um, you know, really nice guy. He became a college professor, actually. <laughs> so I have this theory that uh, some of your... <laughs> some <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. Some of your college professors may have Asperger's syndrome, and that's why they are. And doctors, uh, doctors with poor 
what they refer to as bedside manner. They're they're not very affable. Uh, some of these guys may they, you know, it's easy for them to concentrate because they don't really make a lot of uh, social connections anyway. Uh, but uh, yeah. Anyway, that and that's just a theory of mine. It's doesn't really mean a whole lot. As people age, there seems to be a steady decline in brain size that begins as early as the 30s and begins to accelerate after age 45. Uh, I'm 72 right now, so this is, is kind of depressing for me. However, the degree of decline seems to vary from individual to individual, from barely evident to exaggerated. Yet brain expansion seems to continue to occur, as is evidenced by the presence of growth cones in the frontal lobe, even in the oldest individuals. So we can still learn things even when we're in our hundreds. As an individual enters their fifth decade, their hippocampal formation begins to shrink. The super, uh, supratemporal gyrus also loses volume. In fact, most areas of the brain begin to lose volume. Uh, so uh, your brain, of course, your, your youthful brain, uh, is uh, filling up your entire uh, skull. Uh, mine's bouncing around like a ping pong ball inside my my skull, and the and, and actually that's not true. It's even even if my brain were uh, fist size, uh, it would the uh, area around it would fill up with fluid so that it wouldn't move around like that. Over four million uh, Americans suffer from Alzheimer's disease. Oddly, the possibility of developing symptoms of Alzheimer's increases with age until the age of 85, and then it starts to decline for those people who have never developed symptoms. Alzheimer's disease starts as memory loss, but progresses into greater and greater cognitive function decline until the individual can no longer carry on a conversation. Alzheimer's is accompanied by a marked uh, cortical atrophy, especially in the frontal, temporal, and parietal areas. The brains of Alzheimer's patients show degeneration of axon terminals and dendrites caused by the buildup of beta amyloid forming senile plaque. Amyloid precursor protein is bound by two enzymes, beta uh, secretase and presenilin. Uh, if one of these enzymes mutates, amyloid plaque builds up. Some cells show abnormalities called neurofibrillary tangles. Uh, these are tangles of the neurofilaments uh, that are produced in abundance in the presence of the uh, protein tau. Uh, another um, gene mutation may allow Alzheimer's disease. Uh, APO, APOE4 is supposed to break down the amyloid plaque, but is less efficient than the APOE2 or APOE3 uh, versions. So... Um, Genetically, if you have this uh, type of uh, uh, gene structure, the APOE4, uh, then you're more likely to develop um, Alzheimer's disease. These two uh, break continue to break down the amyloid plaque, and you are okay. With both amyloid plaque and neurofibrillary tangles clogging the former functional neurons of the brain, the basal forebrain nuclei die, uh, the cells that produce acetylcholine, and the memory uh, function of the brain dies with them. And we're going to, I'm going to show you two videos about Alzheimer's disease. memory I think is good. I think it's good. But I mean, I know the telephone numbers and my call and everything else. But sometimes it gets blurry. My memory? I think it's pretty good. But important things I don't seem to remember. If I could, I would be in, out of college. I was in denial about how bad the Alzheimer's was. But I saw it progressing. It was getting worse. He was sleeping more and more. Um, he was he was just like out of it sometimes. My dad was able to do everything, and now he's he's not he's able to barely care for himself. William and Harvey are just two of the 5.3 million people in the United States living with Alzheimer's disease, according to the Alzheimer's Association. 
and a new case is diagnosed every 70 seconds. Alzheimer's disease is what we call a progressive neurodegenerative disease, and that's just a fancy way of saying that cells in the brain or neurons are dying because of the disease process. While no one really knows what causes Alzheimer's, some of the signs include impaired memory, restlessness, language deterioration, emotional apathy, impaired behavior, and confusion. And the family is great. We had two sons, and one was a PhD, and I can't remember the other one. My father, he used to own a gin mill, then he went into the butcher shop business, and he also delivered beer and soda around town and people working for him. It was an interesting life. He made it interesting, so did my mother. And they're still both around, too. Now I'm 92 years old. How about that? If memory changes lead to real functional problems, people are not recognizing people that they've known for years, people are forgetting how to get to places they've gone to for years, or people just aren't able to remember things that they used to be able to remember to the point that it's affecting their ability to live their life, to carry out their daily tasks, that's when it's time to seek the help of a professional. This way. That's when Linda decided she needed some assistance. People would come to the house and he would just let them in. Strangers, perfect strangers, he would let into the house. And they would stay for hours. And I would worry that they'd be walking around my house, uh, you know, checking it out for later or possibly taking things. Or I didn't know, he was signing contracts for services that we didn't need. Now Linda takes Harvey to a special day center for Alzheimer's patients where he spends time with his new friend William and a dozen other patients. Both men are living more stimulating lives as the day center helps them to adjust to their future. One more. The human brain is a remarkable organ. Complex chemical and electrical processes take place within our brains that let us speak, move, see, remember, feel emotions, and make decisions. Inside a normal, healthy brain, billions of cells, called neurons, constantly communicate with one another. They receive messages from each other as electrical charges travel down the axon to the end of the neuron. The electrical charges release chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. The transmitters move across microscopic gaps or synapses between neurons. They bind to receptor sites on the dendrites of the next neuron. This cellular circuitry enables communication within the brain. Healthy neurotransmission is important for the brain to function well. Alzheimer's disease disrupts this intricate interplay. By compromising the ability of neurons to communicate with one another, the disease over time destroys memory and thinking skills. Scientific research has revealed some of the brain changes that take place in Alzheimer's disease. Abnormal structures called beta amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles are classic biological hallmarks of the disease. Plaques form when specific proteins in the neuron's cell membrane are processed differently. Normally, an enzyme called alpha-secretase sniffs amyloid precursor protein, or APP, releasing a fragment. A second enzyme, gamma-secretase, also sniffs APP in another place. These released fragments are thought to benefit neurons. In Alzheimer's disease, the first cut is made most often by another enzyme, beta-secretase. That, combined with the cut made by gamma-secretase, results in the release of short fragments of APP called beta-amyloid. When these fragments clump together, they become toxic and interfere with the function of neurons. As more fragments are added, these oligomers increase in size and become insoluble. 
eventually forming beta amyloid plaques. Neurofibrillary tangles are made when a protein called tau is modified. In normal brain cells, tau stabilizes structures critical to the cell's internal transport system. Nutrients and other cellular cargo are carried up and down the structures called microtubules to all parts of the neuron. In Alzheimer's disease, abnormal tau separates from the microtubules, causing them to fall apart. Strands of this tau combine to form tangles inside the neuron, disabling the transport system and destroying the cell. Neurons in certain brain regions disconnect from each other and eventually die, causing memory loss. As these processes continue, the brain shrinks and loses function. We now know a great deal about changes that take place in the brain with Alzheimer's disease, but there is still much to learn. What other changes are taking place in the aging brain and its cells? And what influence do other diseases, genetics, and lifestyle factors have on the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease as the brain and body age? Scientific research is helping to unravel the mystery of Alzheimer's and related brain disorders. As we learn more, researchers move ever closer to discovering ways to treat and ultimately prevent this devastating fatal disease. Yay. Okay. Let's get out of here. There we go. Okay. I think that's it. And that is it. Okay. Well, that's all. Um, a lot of things I said today, you got to remember that is just uh, a lot of it has to do with speculation. Uh, it's, some of it's opinion, my opinion. Uh, you can't, you know, it's just an idea, okay? Uh, don't, don't take any of this as the gospel just because I said it. Um, I, you know, I, I, I have different ideas than, than other people may have. Um, so... I'll see you guys next week, okay? Talk to you later.